Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering DevNet Create 2017. Brought to you by Cisco. Welcome back everyone, we're here live in San Francisco for theCUBE special exclusive coverage of Cisco's inaugural event, DevNet Create, a foray into the developer open source world as they extend their classic DevNet core developer program, three years old now going into the open source world. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier, my co-host Peter Burris, our next guest is Matt Howard, EVP and CMO of Sonatype, um, knows something about open source, Matt, great to have you on theCUBE. Thanks for uh, joining us. Thanks for having me. So first, talk about Sonatay. What do you guys do? Give a quick minute to describe the company, then I got some pointed questions for you. Well, we provide tools and intelligence to modern development organizations to basically reinvent how open source components are flowing through uh, the pipeline, through the value chain, through the development life cycle. You guys are a service? SaaS service, are you guys a subscription? It's a subscription service and uh, we provide two products. There's a, a product which is a repository manager called Nexus where you uh, store, organize, and distribute software binaries into the development lifecycle. And then there's a, a second uh, server product called Nexus IQ which provides intelligence on top of those binaries. So think of it as like FDA food labeling database. So if you're looking at a bag of potato chips as a consumer, you can see that there's calories, sugar, salt, it's gluten free. If you're looking at a software binary, you're able to see metadata that we provide which allows you as a developer to make intelligent decisions with respect to this component's good for my application because it's properly licensed, or this component's good for, for my application because it doesn't have so any you're known security you're verifying code, basically, yeah, in a way. Yeah, absolutely. So verifying and qualifying the, the open source. And the problem source. you solve for the customer is what? The customer basically gets to build applications at scale, at speed, with quality open source components. So you take the worries off, like whether the licensing, does it work well? Licensing, you, security, you like Yelp for, you, you like Yelp for a software? Uh, <laughs> Their not, comments? Uh, more, yeah, sort of, I mean, more like Amazon <laughs> reviews for uh, open source binaries. Uh, okay, great, cool, thanks for taking the time. So we were just talking on our intro, uh, open source, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to know one. We used to, you know, pirate software and then open source, whoo, this is great. Now, and then it became a tier two in the enterprise player. Red Hat brought it to tier one. It's booming. The communities are changing. You're in the middle of it. What's happening? Give us your take on how open source is evolving because it's the classic case of, you know, cliche, open source, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants before me, and when you now, the next generation is standing on the current generations of shoulders, a new generation's ha happening. What's going on? So, so it, you know, just think of supply and demand, Sim simple supply. Uh, we live in a world right now where development organizations are uh, facing an infinite supply of open source. I mean, there's a thousand new open source projects a day, 10,000 new versions, and 14 releases per year. The supply is massive. And in a world where supply is incredible, consumption is equally incredible. Last year alone, there were 52 billion download requests from Maven Central for Java binaries, 50 billion plus requests for NPM packages in the JavaScript ecosystem. So uh, we are basically dealing with a world where software is no longer a marginal cost to doing business, it is the business. I mean, developers are king, mm -hmm. uh, developers are the lifeblood that's flowing through mm -hmm. every great enterprise today because innovation is ultimately the thing that will allow companies to compete and win on a global playing field. I mean, it's almost intoxicating for these guys who are just drinking from the trough of free software because if you compound the new projects with the fact that Google and these guys are donating like awesome libraries, Amazon's you know, uh, machine learning stuff is not something to shake a stick at. It's great software. Yeah, TensorFlow, no. Spanner, I mean all this stuff. It's great out software, there. And, and just think, in a world of infinite choice, which is what the world we're living in, how do you make the best choice? So where's the growth coming from? Peter and I were speculating that in talking to Abby Kearns yesterday from Cloud Foundry, uh, and then with the Cloud Native Foundation, a lot of money's coming in, so the business model for players, the vendors are coming in, and suppliers now uh, helping out and donating software. But we, we're speculating that there's a whole growth area that's different than we've seen before. Um, are we on that? Are your comments to that? Are your thoughts on, on where this evolution's coming from, the next wave? Is it horizontal? We, you know, our, our view is that, that the DevOps transformation from, from waterfall native development to DevOps native software development is happening and it's real and it's um, arguably in the early days, but it's, it's no stopping that train now. Um, as organizations continue to um, sort of reconcile, you know, uh, you know, demand from board members and shareholders yeah. and CEOs, 
I mean, how do you remain relevant? How do you be, uh, put yourself into a position where you're innovating with software fast enough to remain competitive? And that's a tremendous pressure, and it's driving you know, transformational change like DevOps. And so as that uh, demand for speed continues to grow, we think you know, it only increases the appetite for open source, and it creates opportunities for organizations like ours to basically automate how that open source innovation happens. We do a lot of crowd chats, and we do surface the landscape, and the common theme that comes up is, oh, your organizational mindset has to change. And we were commenting, Peter and I were talking yesterday about, if your org's not set up, you'll have, uh, what's the law? Conway's, Conway's law, where the, the out, out, output is, matches the organization. But the bigger question is, um, you know, Ford CEO got fired. He's been in the job for less than four years. He didn't have time to transform. So the, the, the question is, how does open source help people transform faster? Do um, you have any observations around that? Because that's the number one question we get is, okay, I need to configure resources to do that. And then the other theme that we're hearing, I'd love to get your reaction on is, oh my God, I'm going to lose my job through automation. And certainly Cisco has networking guys who are looking at the, down the barrel of potentially being irrelevant if they don't make the network programmable. So, you know, this is, you know, you, we've lived through the cycles. Is it the mainframe guys who kind of lose their jobs kind of thing going on, or is it a transformative opportunity for the, for the people as well? <laughs> yeah, that's a great <laughs> question. I mean, there's a lot there, but I, 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 I think the notion that, you know, they say software eats the world. I mean, you know, a different way of viewing is automation eats the world. And, and you know, if you look at, uh, we, we refer to the 100-10-1 rule. Today, in every large IT organization, you got 100 developers for every 10 IT operations professionals for every one security professional. Um, you, you know, it's impossible for the application security uh, professionals to uh, maintain governance over 100 software developers. I mean, it's just the old way of doing something like application security in this, in this world where we're talking about infinite supply of open source needs to be automated with machine intelligence. It needs to be scalable early, everywhere, and throughout the entire development life cycle. And unless it's not, you're going to basically get some of the benefit of open source, yeah. but not all of the benefit of open source. Well, I want to push you a little bit on this, Matt, because um, uh, we, we, one might argue, and, at the, and I'm going to be a little bit apocryphal here for a second, but one might argue that we also have an infinite supply of different types of bubble gum. And at the end of the day, <laughs> one can say, well, do we need another bubble gum? We may or may not, and yet we do. Uh, so the reason why I'm bringing that up is I want to square the infinite supply, which I don't disagree with, with the idea that certainly our clients, especially in the big data side, are still concerned about the fact that they can't find tooling or combinations of open source tooling that can help them with their use case. And so yeah. as you think about, one of the things that intrigued me about what your company does is the idea of to what degree can, it, can you start with a business problem use that business problem to do some design work, and then based on that, start finding the tooling that will be most appropriate for solving the problem. Yeah, it's, it's a great question, and I, I think it goes back to this idea of automation. Let's just give a, a real world use case. This is one of many, but if, if, if the demand for speed and innovation is what you know, shareholders, boards, and CEOs are looking for out of their IT organizations and their development teams, then the first thing you do, um, you know, if, if in the theory of constraints, is you look for where is the friction, right? Theory of constraints, and, and there is. So, so theory of constraints basically points to something like the process inside of a large financial organization that involves a developer requesting approval for using an open source component. How long does that take? How many people are involved in that process? How many hours, how many dollars? Does it have to be that hard? Or can you basically create policy and define policy and build effectively a firewall that then automatically governs the flow of open source, healthy open source components into the development life cycle with no human intervention at pace? Right? And that's the idea of what we're doing. When we talk about scaling open source innovation early, everywhere, and across the entire development life cycle, it starts at the perimeter. The moment the developer requests the open source component for use, it has to be automated. You can't afford to take three months to approve it. He needs it now. So let me, let me turn that around and see if, if this is a service that you are providing or actually could provide. Um, Given that you probably have visibility into a lot of the problems that the developer's trying to solve, and therefore their ability to check open source in and out from a variety of different sources, are you also gaining visibility into the types of stuff that people can't find and making that information available to the world about, here's some of the places where 
the open source world could step up and do perhaps a better job of do, delivering that software. And I'm specifically thinking of the big data universe because there are so many, for example, I got a client, big financial institution, who is tearing his hair out right now, trying to come up with some standard componentry for complex machine learning pipelines. Real, real hard job, a lot of different tools, they work together at some level, but they're not solving the problem because they're more focused on serving of solving each other's each each other project's problem. Am I making sense? You are making a lot of sense, and you should introduce us to your friend because we would love to have a conversation and talk exactly how it is that you can create prescriptive architectures with open source components to remove friction back to the theory of constraints concept. I mean, this this process of innovation has to flatten out. And we are very narrowly focused on one particular piece of the that 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 pipeline, and it is the making sure that the development organization is benefiting from all of the greatness that open source has to offer, but none of the bad. And you have to do that with automation. So, just really quick, John, the uh, for those of you who don't know, the theory of constraints to a computer science person looks like Andal's law: speed up that which you do most frequently. For those right. of you who've ever done Herbie computer the Boy design, Scout. <laughs> exactly. So, it's speed up the thing that is causing the most pain. Right. 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 So the question I have for you is, okay, given what you guys do, which is great service, uh, cutting edge, it's in the DevOps wheelhouse, so what is, in your opinion, the uh, most important metric for your customer success vis-a-vis -vis DevOps? Okay, I, I'm in, I've been hearing about this cloud native thing and DevOps, we've got to change to Agile. We wrote a manifesto, we changed our organization. What is the important metric that you think they should look for for success? I, you know, there's a lot of metrics. There's no one answer, but I'll give you a, a really great one. Since you, you mentioned Red Hat earlier, um, Red Hat is an amazing company that has um, probably done more for the evolution of open source than anyone. Um, they have a, a phenomenal track record of managing, you know, RHEL, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux stack, uh, upstream and downstream to the point where today, you know, they publicly touted at the Red Hat Summit uh, just recently in Boston, you know, like a, I think it's a day or two meantime to repair for a zero day vulnerability. They understand the supply chain for RHEL extremely well. And you know, from our perspective, we are trying to create the same type of hygiene for custom software development that RHEL has long practiced in support of Red Hat. Uh, Red Hat has long practiced in support of RHEL. And, and so, meantime to repair, for example, if a zero day vulnerability hits, do you have a software bill of materials? Are you wondering where that particular component is? Do you even have the component? How many applications in yeah. production are affected? I mean, this is a real world scenario just two weeks ago with Struts 2. How many, how many, you know, how many organizations are still working today to figure out the answer to that question. You'd be surprised, it takes organizations months. But this is more than a library. This is more than a library. So explain what the explain why it's more than a library. Struts too? No, what you're doing. Uh, it, <laughs> what we're basically doing is imagining a software supply chain. So uh, step back and sort of imagine a world where you could build software applications the same way that Toyota builds cars, right? You have Deming's principles, which says you basically take and source the components or the parts from the fewer suppliers and you source the absolute best parts and you track and trace the location of those parts through every step of the supply chain all the way into production. So that Toyota recently had to conduct an orderly and effective recall for four million Takata airbags, right? Mm -hmm. In software terms, the next time you're basically sitting on top of a zero day, you need the equivalent of that orderly effective recall so you can in a matter of minutes, not months, you know, Patch that vulnerability. Hence why I use gold rates theory of constraints. Correct. So in many respects, this is a this is a digital supply chain tool. We believe it's software supply chain automation. What about digital? Can I also think about how digital objects can be included in that? Again, going back to containers? This, going back to the big data notion? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is supply chain theory is well understood in a physical goods world. Um, certainly, if you look at how uh, physical goods uh, move through a supply chain and you come to grips with what's happening in sort of digital transformation today and the evolution of DevOps and the proliferation of open source, um, you know, continuous integration, continuous delivery, speed is king. You know, it's all going in the direction of a supply chain. So I've, when you have so much bubble gum, as Peter said, you, <laughs> if, after it loses its flavor, you get a new piece, right? So same with software. Um, final question for you. You guys are doing well. I can imagine that operationally, as companies operationalize open source, you're a key component there. Um, yep. And that seems like a good opportunity. How early are you on that on that operational um, 
progress. I mean, it's not, I guess well, it's just getting started, I mean, making some money, yeah, which is well, good. Yeah, well, but, you know, to uh, be frank. We're the customer on the journey. In other words, people realize that I got to operationalize, so they're just doing it, not in, kind of having a checks and balance. Our business is really interesting in the sense that, you know, uh, product market fit for any young company uh, can take quite a while and, and you know we, we're fortunate enough to have a CEO who is remarkably patient and savvy and experienced and his name is Wayne Jackson. For anybody who knows uh, here at the Cisco conference he was previously the CEO of Sourcefire mm -hmm. so an interesting connection there but but patience is key and, and we're being rewarded right now because all of the trends that you guys have already talked about here and everything we've talked about at Cisco DevNet you know point to um, you know a, a simple fact which is that that software um, is, is key to how companies will compete and win in the future. And as long as that, that's true, they're going to be looking for ways to, to, to improve uh, innovation. Um, right now, our business is early. We're still creating budget in some situations, um, but that's increasingly um, changing. And I would say that you should expect our business to continue to grow. So people are operationalizing open source and getting serious about some of these We're things. We're seeing budget now that we didn't see last year. So is operationalizing. We're operationalizing the flow of open source into a DevOps pipeline. Final, final question since uh, I want to get your take on the show. Cisco's moves here into this world, uh, obviously a good move in our opinion, I'm sure you agree. Um, risky for them, a good move, progress, what, sh what should they do next? Your thoughts and reaction to DevNet Create? Because men, they got DevNet, a growing robust community of Cisco developers. DevNet create a new opportunity. What's your thoughts? You know, I, I'm, uh, I've learned a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, glad to be here and you know, just saw some things yesterday that make it very, very clear that DevNet create and what Cisco's doing with it is, is a great move. I mean, you know, uh, as I, my personal belief is that developers are king and, and, and as you expose core services, network services uh, to developers and you know, innovation happens and value gets created and so, um, they've done so much at the network layer for so many years, and if they're now exposing that network you know, sort of innovation to developers, um, it'll be exciting to see what kind of innovation happens. Matt, thanks for coming on theCUBE, really appreciate it. I'm glad we got you in, great to meet you last night, and uh, congratulations on your, on your startup that you're working with and growth, and been around the industry a long time. You've seen a lot of waves, and uh, appreciate the insight here on theCUBE, appreciate it. Appreciate you having me. All right, we are live in San Francisco for exclusive coverage of Cisco's inaugural event, DevNet Create. I'm John Furrier, Peter Burris. Stay with us for more day two coverage after this short break. Hi, I'm April Mitchell, and I'm the Senior Director of Strategy and Planning for Cisco